Good morning, all. We are very happy to greet you all for Japan Hubba 2021, the Tech Fair. Today we have three sessions: the Tech Fair, uh, the Tech Talks, Education Fair, and the Startup Showcase Fair. This is from Japanese university uh, uh, companies. Firstly, I request. Mr. Janaki Raman, the President of Indo-Japan Chamber of Commerce and Industry for his welcome address. Jani, uh, usually he is called as Jani San, and um, he is the founder and chairman at Nuve Pro Technologies Private Limited. He has 30 years of experience in the product engineering arena, uh, specifically on IT products. He was among the first five uh, employees of Wipro when it entered into IT space. He left Wipro as chief executive of global R&D in 1999 and co-founded Mindtree along with nine other co-founders. He has been a founder and executive council member of India Semiconductor Association, ISA, for five years. Currently, he is the president of Indo-Japan Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Over to you, Jani-san. Thank you, Anjana. Uh, good morning to all. Konnichiwa. Welcome to this uh, Japan Hub Technology Fair. This time, it's a virtual event. And uh, the environment in terms of the pandemic has made us to come together virtually. In a way, it's a challenge but in a way it's an opportunity. Today we are able to have people like Takeyari-san participating from Japan that had been possible more because of going virtual. So let us have the best of the virtual and real world in future and hope the next year will be even grander than this year. Uh, it had been a pleasure and privilege to work with the Japan Hub organizers. They have put up together every year a wonderful event of people coming together, celebrating culture, celebrating business, celebrating togetherness as India and Japan. And the Indian Institute of Science has played a very, very key role in terms of helping us putting together this program in their venue every year. And in addition to that, they have helped us in terms of creating this technology fair which has worked out very well in terms of bringing the technical minds together in terms of thinking about the future and how India and Japan can collaborate. IJCCA had been a key partner to this event and our focus is to enable business and commerce to flourish between India and Japan. And we do it on various ways and we collaborate with various organizations that are related to India and Japan to make it happen. And JETRO had been a major partner for us and helped us in terms of putting together several programs which had been fairly successful. We look forward to the technology fair having three tracks, as Anjana San was mentioning. One is the technical talk by the experts. Uh, we had the pleasure and privilege of several uh, leading uh, people like Takeyari-san today joining us virtually from Japan. Uh, he had been head of the Sony Center before and today sitting at Japan is helping us in various forms in terms of bringing India and Japan together. We have Professor Sinha, we have Professor Katoka-san, we have Dr. Nagakova-san and finally uh, we need to mention that Dr. Srinivas had been the backbone of this program and helped us in terms of making it happen. Let us listen to the technical talks. There are several takeaways that we will be able to have in terms of how they view the future of technology and how they find India and Japan can collaborate. Post that, we will have a higher education uh, uh, opportunity track. This is more by the Japanese universities. As all of you know, India in general had more leaned upon the West and had been sending students to the US and UK and Europe universities. But the times are changing. 
and Japan and India collaborations are tremendously improving. And in addition to that, the future of the world is going to be more towards East rather than West. And this is the time for Indian and Japanese universities as well as students to collaborate. And the best way for India to promote business with Japan is at a grassroots level in terms of our students knowing the education opportunities at Japan and how we will be able to work together. So I look forward to uh, this program being conducted uh, in a grand manner where several Japanese universities will be able to participate, enlighten our students on the potential opportunity for education. And once the seeds are grow, sown there, then I am sure it will grow as trees where our people will be able to work in Japanese organizations, Indian organizations, bring them together, not only as students, but as future business people. The world has gone through uh, several changes and uh, the world has become small, uh, where we need to be together virtually. And that had been possible with several technologies that have come from startups. Startups are going to play a very, very important role in future. And I believe that we as technologists need to nurture startup, encourage startup, and make sure that they are successful. Those are the small companies which grow up into big and make things happen. That's how we have Google happen. That's how we have Zoom happen. And we need to see how we can seed more startups between India and Japan and collaborate. The world has gone virtual and several technologies have come together. Uh, without that, we would have come to a grinding halt in this pandemic world. It is internet, it is the cloud, it is big data, it is analytics, it's IoT, it's NLP, so many other things. And you will hear about many of these technologies and how they are changing the world during this tech fair. It is time to celebrate technology in this virtual world. And I would like to welcome the experts to come together and contribute in this event. Uh, thanks to all and uh, look forward to your active participation, not only in the seminar, but in addition to that in the question and answer session. Thank you. Arigato Vasumas. Thank you very much, uh, Jani-san, for indeed a very comprehensive briefing of the whole Japan Hubba Tech Fair. Thank you so much once again. <clears throat> so um, I uh, invite uh, Mr. Yukio Takeyari, the chairman of NASCOM Japan Council and former managing director of Sony India Software Center. He has over 30 years of experience in software uh, development in embedded software, PC and network services and has served in various management and leadership positions in Sony Corporation Tokyo, since October 2008 to November 2015, uh, 2015. He has worked for Sony India Software Center in Bangalore as managing director. Since April 2014, he has been chair of NASCOM uh, Japan Council to promote India-Japan relationship in IT industry and is continuing this activity in Japan. He has been the chairman of Bangalore Japan Association from 2011 to May uh, 2013. He holds the BS and MS degree in electrical engineering from Keio University. Welcome to you, Takeyari san. Over to you now. Uh, Anjana san, thank you very much for kind introductions. Thank you, sir. I'd like to share the, my presentation today. So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Yukio Takeari. I, I used to be a MD of a Sony India Software Center in Bangalore. So, I stay in Bangalore from 2008 up to 2015 for seven years. I really enjoy to stay in India. But before going to India, actually, already uh, Anjana san explained about my career. I graduated from Keio University in Japan and uh, immediately joined the Sony Corporation. I spent uh, uh, almost whole my life at Sony Corporation. I worked on a various computer product like uh, engine workstation, like uh, PCs, and a lot of software development I worked on. 
at Sony headquarters. Well, because of that, I frequently visiting to US Silicon Valley. I know very much about the uh, strengths of a US IT industry, computer industry. And, uh, but uh, from 2008, I was a chance to come to the uh, Silicon Valley in Bangalore. This was the start of my most exciting uh, experience in my life. And I finally stayed in seven years in Japan. But uh, before going to Bangalore, I didn't know that much about uh, India at all. But my first visit to India was 2001, almost 20 years back. Uh, like uh, my boss, I, uh, you know, uh, well, I used to work for the bio. The, my immediate boss was became a kind of Sony's president, and uh, he was requested to come down to the Bangalore for inaugurating a Sony's new office in Bangalore. I joined this uh, delegation, and uh, I took uh, same flight. Like I, they fly by corporate jet. That was uh, my first visit to India, and uh, so, but I didn't know that much about India at all. And especially on the way back, I have to take a commercial flight, Bangalore airport, or the Bangalore airport. And I, I was so surprised about uh, like a small airport and uh, like it looks like a bus station. And uh, I thought I would never come back to Bangalore anymore. Actually in this spot, I was sitting in the leftmost position, but uh, I cannot imagine that I'm coming back to India seven years later. But, uh, it's the start of the more, most exciting uh, experience in, in, in my career. And uh, so I worked for Sony India Software Center, uh, like uh, in this photo. Uh, Sony has a, like a software development center in Bangalore and uh, they are working for uh, various IT and uh, also the uh, software development for Sony product. And uh, during my stay in India, this organization grew a lot and became uh, one of the strategic, uh, very important strategic uh, organization for Sony Group companies. And uh, after coming back to Japan, but I'm still connecting to uh, various uh, Bangalore people. Actually, we started two years back, uh, Bangalore Association of Japan, we started. This was the first meeting in Tokyo and more than 100 people gathered for these parties. And some of the people came from Bangalore for, to participate in this event. Many of them are contributing a lot of uh, event for the Japan Hub, hub in, in Bangalore. And uh, I hope to continue to this type of networking, uh, even in Japan, that I'm doing right now. And also, I'm talking in a various occasions about uh, potential in the IT industries and uh, in a various occasions. And uh, also, I publish a book, uh, title is India Shift. Subtitle is Why are the world top company are establishing r and Center in Bangalore? I try to explain about uh, IT industry's excitement and uh, but the most important message in this book is if India Japan can work together much closer way, we can create a lot of a global innovation. That's a key message in this book. Actually, I like to talk brief about uh, like a situation of India IT industry, but many of them are you are the Indian people living in Bangalore. You should meet. You should know about this. And uh, this is a uh, uh, India IT industry is gross. You can see from 2000, it was just $8 billion revenue in total IT industry, but now it's became 191. So 24 times growth of the IT industry. It's an amazing growth for the last 20 years. India GDP grew six times the last 20 years, and still half of the Japanese GDP, GDPs. Maybe 10 years later, India GDP catch up to Japan. So. But already IT industry wise, you are much quick, larger than the uh, Japanese IT industries. That's the current situation of the India IT industries. Also, like in the IT industry quickly changing, evolving uh, right now, not only the scale, a lot of the new disruptive technologies are emerging, but uh, you are quickly catching up new technology like a uh, cloud, big data, AI, IoT blockchains, the quickly it's becoming a new opportunity for the IT industries. And also most exciting one is a startup ecosystem. Even for last five years, more than 11,000 startup app was founded uh, last five years. But not only the startup, like uh, a number of the startup, like some of the companies, a startup is quickly growing up. Right now, more than 38, uh, about 38 unicorn company was, uh, became a unicorn company already. Even for last years, uh, during the, coronavirus pandemic, a 12 company was added to the list of the unicorns. It's amazing the growth of the IT industries. But uh, to take a look at the relationship of the uh, India IT industry with other countries, 
Most of the businesses are from US, like 62% is US, second largest is UK, and then Europe and APAC. And uh, there is no category like uh, Japan, but uh, Japan is categorized as the rest of the world. It's uh, something like 1%, honestly speaking. This is the current situation of the India-Japan IT relationship. The, there are several reasons for this. One is a uh, language barrier is one of the reasons for India-Japan collaboration. It's a big carry barrier for Japanese company to use uh, India IT service company. But also way of thinking uh, we are so different. So if we don't know that much about each other, very difficult to work together. This is a kind of realities. But uh, I'd like to show you some data well, about uh, explaining, uh, explaining about the situations. Uh, in Japan, there are many foreign people living in Japan. This is a totally uh, 2.6 million people living in Japan. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, Indian people living in Japan is uh, less than 40,000, very small number of Jap Indian people living in Japan. And furthermore, international students, uh, like many uh, like countries sending a student to, to Japan for studying. But uh, in Indian uh, student is just uh, less than 2,000 people only compared to other countries, very small numbers, honestly speaking. I know the Indian people are going to US are more than two lakh people, 200,000 people studying in US. But unfortunately, Japanese people are in Japan, they are not coming that much as of, as of today. But of course, the number is gro gradually growing up. I, I really expecting a much more Indian people come to Japan for the higher study to work for Japanese companies. And also on the other hand, there are many Japanese people working outside of Japan this is a 1.4 million people is working outside of Japan. Many of the people going to US and uh, China is a 10 lakh, one lakh people. But in, in India, there's just 10,000 people only. It means a 1.3 billion population in India, but uh, only 10,000 Japanese people work in, living in India. This is a uh, honestly like uh, mutual like uh, people, Indian people in Japan uh, Japanese people in India is very small number. We need to increase this number. Without doing this, maybe we may not understand that much. That's the current situation for the like uh, data, based on the data. But on the ha other hand, uh, this is a very interesting report published by uh, Jetro last year. And this was a survey done for highly skilled Indian talent in Japan. Uh, this survey is done for 27 Japanese companies who have uh, uh, like experience in hiring highly skilled Indian talent. Looks like 80% of a company has very positive evaluation for the employment and retentions. And also satisfaction rate for highly skilled Indian talent is almost 100% as expected or above expectations. Very good uh, like result. And also the Indian talent, 56, 56 Indian talent answer the questions. More than 63% uh, of the Indian time want to continue work in Japan for mid-term to long-term. Of course, some people want to go back to India, some people want to the other country, but the uh, 60% majority of people want to stay in Japan because of uh, various reasons. One is the technological capability of Japanese companies, also livability of Japan, like the culture and the, uh, climate and safety, also Japanese cultures. I think uh, once uh, Indian people come to Japan, I absolutely they like to live in Japan and work for Japanese company. That's a kind of positive uh, like uh, 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 data for, for the futures. So already I, uh, I'm just explained about, I'm continuing a NASCOM Japan Council since 2014 uh, to strengthen uh, India-Japan collaboration for the growth of the IT relationship. And uh, also, not only myself, like uh, uh, there are various activities happening last couple of years, especially like uh, Japan India Startup Hub was founded 2018 in Bangalore. This is a very important uh, organization to connecting a Japanese company to Indian companies, in, including a startup. Also, Japan India Digital Partnership was uh, agreed upon both government. And uh, some of the Japanese companies start investing uh, like Indian startup. Also last year, the Japan India Cyber Security Pact was agreed upon. So a lot of progress in the government levels. And uh, also I like to touch upon uh, why one uh, topics uh, I'm uh, related to these activities. One of the uh, Keio universe, I actually graduated for many years back. Uh, Keio has a very unique campus, so-called SFC, so Shonan Fisa campus. 
they started the India Japan laboratory since last year. Uh, this laboratory is, is not doing research about India, more research for the India Japan collaborations for the technology areas, environmental area, cultural area. So those are area of the focus. Actually, key professor is a Jun Murai, Professor Jun Murai. He is a very famous person in Japan, father of the internet in Japan. Also, Professor Rajiv Shaw is a like a, a expert about uh, environment and disaster management. And uh, I'm helping at these initiatives. Actually, uh, last month, uh, there was a very interesting event, the so-called uh, Social Innovation Challenge, together with the Indian Institute of Science. And uh, uh, like uh, more than uh, like requested a proposal for the social innovation. Actually, 175 proposal and the proof of concept was uh, submitted. Actually, I was one of the like evaluators. I, I read the every uh, proposal. Very interesting. I realized the uh, India can be a kind of a, a country with social innovations. Actually, uh, there are many reasons for this. India has a huge diversity and also various uh, problems, including a social problem, and, uh, but uh, also a lot of constraint for the cost and the infrastructures. But uh, India has a lot of technology, new technologies, and they can leverage. And also young talent who, who can leverage that new technologies and uh, with uh, ideas. And also many of them have entrepreneurship. I think uh, this is a kind of, you know, India can say, uh, I can say uh, country innovation. Also a uh, jugal spirit is maybe good for like uh, innovation thinking. And on the other hand, in Japan, uh, as you may know, since last year, September, new government, new cabinet started. And uh, Suga, Prime Minister Suga-san uh, is immediately promoting, accelerating digital transformations. Actually, Japan is a very developed country, but uh, in terms of digitalization, may not be advanced enough, like uh, you know the other uh, developed countries. But uh, because of coronavirus pandemic, we need to accelerate the digital transformations. Actually, uh, like uh, maybe coming this September, new digital agency will be set up, and the government is seriously pushing the digitalization of the government and also industries. But uh, if you think about India, uh, India started a digital India project. Uh, like uh, I think uh, I'm carefully looking at a uh, lot of progress about uh, digital India. Adal, for example, is a very interesting idea using a biometric based ID systems. And also like, it was uh, like uh, more than uh, 1 billion people registered in the five and a half years. Actually in Japan promoting uh, my number systems, which is almost a 12 digit number similar ideas, but unfortunately last five years, only 20, less than 20% re people registered only. But not only that India created India stock, very interesting uh, software architectures. I think uh, it created a lot of uh, like, uh, you know, the change for India, society of India, especially for paperless, cashless, uh, presence is, is uh, quickly achieving. And uh, I think uh, we can learn from this experience as a uh, Japan, but on the other hand, uh, I like to talk about a little bit about Made in Japan and Sony. And actually, uh, like uh, Sony was founded 1946, just after the World War II. Original name was Tokyo Tsushin Kogyo. It was not a Sony at all, but uh, later on changed the name. And uh, but Sony was founded by two founders, Akio Morita and Masaru Ibuka, both uh, engineering background. They just started uh, like a uh, company as a startup 1946. And uh, they started developing a various innovative product and develop a Japan first product and later on such as uh, transistor radios, uh, tape recorders. Later on, Sony developed uh, like a uh, uh, consumer video recorder product uh, for the, it, it, this was a world first group of product. And then a lot of effort make uh, as a company and uh, make a Sony brand as a global brand. But not only a Sony brand, but uh, Sony, not only Sony, like uh, Made in Japan is becoming a very high quality uh, like uh, uh, image we can create. But not only because of the Sony's effort, many Japanese companies made a lot of effort to make it happen. Actually, uh, this book was published by Mori Akio Morita, Morita-san. Uh, 1986 in English in US and later on translated in Japanese. But uh, until after the Sony was founded 1946, it takes more than 40 years. Made in became a you know, high quality product. 
because of before when the Sony started, the Japanese product was not considered to be a high quality product at all, honestly. But uh, this takes a little longer time, but uh, we could make it uh, made in Japan is a high quality product. I think a lot of things that uh, you India can learn. Actually, India is uh, like uh, promoting a make in India and uh, as a government, it's, I think uh, this is a very important initiative. I think uh, already India can get catch up the uh, digital technologies, but I need to uh, improve the product design and the manufacturing capabilities. Of course, uh, you can leverage a lot of new digital technology, but not only that, you can learn from Japan uh, in a various aspect, especially for the management and the process. I think uh, you can learn from this. So my point is uh, Japan can learn a lot from the India. Also India can learn from Japan. If you can work together, we can create a lot of uh, innovative products. So as you may know, like a uh, lot of new digital technologies are emerging, like uh, disruptive technology is emerging right now, but the uh, hardware and software have to be combined in much closer ways. Uh, there are many areas to uh, creating a global solution to if India, Japan can work together. I really expect uh, like a uh, huge opportunity for India-Japan collaborations. I sincerely expect the India-Japan partnership may create a global innovations. Thank you very much for your attention. Over to you. Oh, uh, thank you, Takeyari san, a friend and bridge to India, Japan. Thank you once again for a de providing detailed information on the need of Indian talent requirement in Japan and more collaboration possibilities between India and Japan. Thank you once again and connecting from Tokyo, Takeyari san. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, we now move on to the next presentation from Professor S.K. Sinha. He is from IASE and founder and chairman of Lab to Market Innovation Private Limited. Uh, Professor Sinha has done his BE in Electrical Engineering from Bihar College of Engineering and ME and PhD in Electrical Engineering from IASE Bangalore. He was a faculty of Electrical Engineering Department at IASE till 1995. He set up a new parallel computing lab in the EE department and most of his research efforts were directed towards applying the parallel and distributed computing techniques for industrial drive applications. At uh, IASE, he set up an embedded uh, system laboratory for the Center for Electronic Design and Technology, CEDT, and now that, has, that lab has matured into a leading training and development center in the area of embedded computing. He set up Lab to Market Innovations Private Limited at IASE, this initiative is seed funded by IISC. Lab to Market is innovating products and solutions to make railways safer and more efficient. Professor, over to you now. Thank you very much, Anjanaji, for your kind words. And uh, uh, thank you very much to uh, the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity, especially to Professor Srinivas, uh, who invited me to uh, make a present about our work at IAC. So uh, let me share my screen and uh, uh, talk about the work that we are doing. As uh, Anjanaji said, uh, this is uh, an initiative which is fully supported by IASC. In 2016, we were uh, incubated and uh, we very proudly, I at least very proudly display this as my first slide everywhere I make a presentation, which is the iconic uh, central office building of uh, my alma mater. Uh,
why I am not able to change here. Okay. So this, as Anjana ji said, this uh, lab to market is seed funded by IAC. They uh, IAC also holds an equity in this company. Plus, uh, we have we are committed to uh, give one percent of our revenue to IAC. So in a way, you can say IAC is a part owner of this company. And there are four serving faculty members uh, of IAC who hold equity in this. It was founded uh, by me. Uh, and uh, another co-founder is Mr. Srinivas Rao, who is a um, uh, railway uh, man, railway signaling person. He was in the railways, Indian Railway Services in the Signal Engineering Department. And apart from that uh, experience of Indian Railways, he is also a serial entrepreneur. Uh, with a track record of six successful uh, startups, and uh, he th his experience both in the real of the railway domain as well as his entrepreneurship and business experience help us a lot. So together uh, we have uh, the team which is uh, propelling this company forward. Uh, basically, this company was started because of my frustration year after year seeing the lot of good work being done at IASC, uh, which had the potential of wealth generation, but it was, I mean, rarely happening if ever. Uh, very good quality innovation ended ending up in uh, academic publications. At the most, some uh, patents were acquired, but those patents also mostly remained on paper, very rarely. Uh, you know, they will work upon and convert it into and, uh, commercial ventures. So my mission or the vision with which I have started this company is to create opportunities for wealth generation from academic research. That, that's, that's what I wish to do. I will take half a minute to say elaborate on that. When we, whenever we want to do innovation, the riskiest part of a true innovation is in the research part, in the R&D part. And we, any, if we are, unless we are, uh, you know, kind of reinventing the wheel, we, there would be failures. And you require the, the, the best quality of mind, the best laboratory equipment, the best quality workers for doing innovation. And then you should be prepared for failures. Now, it, it's very difficult for a startup or a commercial organization to really pay for those innumerable failures before we see the success. Whereas in an academic organization, a public funded institute like IAC and IITs and CSIR labs, uh, they are paid to fail and then finally come up with something meaningful. So that's, that's that uh, failure cost is already absorbed uh, by the agencies. And even after that, that research outcome doesn't uh, uh, go for wealth generation. So the lab to market, the focus is to look at what is going on in this academic environment or in other CSIR laboratories. Look at what are the proof of concept which is available uh, and which can be adapted to different market needs to address the pain points of industries and then take it forward and convert into a product and solution. So that's the mission of the company with which we are working presently. Our strategy, as I briefly mentioned earlier, is the same. We work with academic institutions and research laboratories. We already have tie up with three CSIR laboratories in the company, large ones. I'm talking about CDOT and NAL, uh, that, that level of laboratories. Then we go to the market and uh, locate potential areas, then identify partner companies willing to invest in the development of new technologies for their own use mostly. Uh, presently, that's what is happening and then set up teams and adequate infrastructure to develop marketable product production prototypes. So this is, this is the model with which we are working presently. And our current focus is railways. So we are, we are developing technologies primarily to enhance the safety and efficiency of railway operation in India. And railways are same everywhere. We have, both of us have traveled to several countries and looked at the railway operations and all that there is not much difference in the problems that uh, railway operators face the world over, whether it is US. Or, I have uh, not been lucky enough to visit Japan, but I have visited uh, extensively Europe and uh, North America. And 
we find that the problems are more or less the same that we face in India. So basically, the biggest problem is that the railway assets are static as well as mobile. In India, we have 76,000 kilometers of railway track and the wagons and coaches are going all over. How do we track them? How do we monitor every wheel? Every inch of the track is a safety hazard. Every wheel is a safety hazard. How do we track? How do we monitor? It's a challenge. Presently, it is done mostly manually. So we want to change that. And we are uh, working to instrument the rails and the wheels and whatever else we are allowed to do. And then collect data, they use the latest uh, technologies of AI and signal processing, and then uh, provide inputs to uh, the railway operators. The projects that we are working on currently, which is I am, I am talking about the projects for which we have been paid for and which are already being implemented in the field, in the real life situations. The one is uh, called wheel impact load detector, the while this is a system basically to detect uh, if there is any uh, bad wheel in the train which passes over the instrumented zone. This uh, is being, has been, this project is funded by Indian Railways through their research arm RDSO. There is another uh, project which we have taken, we call it cyber signaling. This is a term coined by us. Basically, this is intended for a non-Indian Railways uh, or non-passenger traffic areas. Uh, many large industries have their own private railway sidings like steel mills and power plants, coal minings and all that. They have their own uh, railway network, which is not, uh, which is quite significant. In fact, there are about 800 uh, such industrial sidings in India and they can't afford the kind of robust systems which Indian railways uses. They are very, very expensive. And so they are entirely dependent on manual inspection, manual working. We are developing uh, systems which are affordable by them and which will provide them 24 bar seven, uh, you know, visibility of the yard to the managers. And one system is already being implemented in uh, uh, Jindal Steel Works, which is one of India's largest steel plants in Bellary in Karna state of Karnataka. Then we have another project uh, which is given to us by uh, Southwestern Railway. This is for real time monitoring and reporting of wheel slide protection. Uh, now the modern coaches come with a device to uh, detect if there is any slippage of the wheel, suppose or the brakes have got stuck and things like that. But these are recorded in the, uh, in the particular coach and then detected only in the depot when the train goes for inspection. So if there has been a fault somewhere, there is a wheel slippage, uh, the drivers uh, of the train doesn't come to know about it. So we have been asked to develop a system by which uh, in the real time or near real time, we can detect it. And if there is a serious problem, it should be alert should be given uh, to the driver or other authorities. So that is the third project, paid project that we are working on. So a little bit about this while that we are uh, presently uh, deploying for Indian Railways. As I said, it is to system to identify defective wheels. A section of the railway track is instrumented with, we are using fiber brag rating sensors, which is an optical uh, kind of sensor. And whenever a train passes over the instrumented zone, uh, the signature of each wheel is captured. Basically the strain that the uh, wheel imparts on the rail is captured and analyzed. And if, uh, some anomaly is found, then uh, it is reported to the concerned authorities. Presently, we are installing two wild systems, both at Bangalore. Uh, this is this just a picture of showing what the part, a defective wheel, like you can see here, the defects have come. And if this is not detected in time, this will grow and also damage the uh, rail on which it runs when at higher speeds. So this is the kind of a typical defect that we develop. And we are using packaged uh, fiber brag rating sensors. We have made the clamps like this. And when they are put it under the foot of the rail, every wheel which passes over that gives a signal like this. This is what we capture. 
as I will show you in a moment, and then analyzed later. Uh, this is two snapshots of people fixing this clamps with the fiber grad sitting in the under the foot of the rail. And uh, this is the fully instrumented zone of one section, one wide section we have done. This is the wayside equipment for this, that optical interrogator and uh, then uh, the networking devices, power supplies, etc. And uh, this is a real actual photograph of a train which has moved over that wild zone. These are the sensors we have placed here. This is load sensor, vibration sensor. And as the wheels go over that, please concentrate on the load sensor. This is the kind of signal that we capture. This is not a simulated thing. This is an actual train movement that we have captured. And this is the data that we store, analyze, and then report if we find any faulty wheel. So uh, the, the way the information is given that uh, in the cloud, uh, we create this kind of a, uh, this is again a, a screenshot of uh, the first page, the welcome page uh, of uh, the wild that we have developed for Indian Railways. And it provides uh, all the information about the train, about uh, how many axles moved over that direction, which train was coming from where, going where, what was the average train speed and any bad wheels that is detected. So with the ID of every axle, both the wheels, whether they are good or bad is shown. If it is bad, then they can click on that. And there are other pages. I am showing only one page. There are 50 odd pages by which the in complete information about the wheel and uh, its loading or impact loading, everything is presented to the railway operators. This has to be done according to their specifications within three minutes of passing of the train we are able to do it in less than a minute or so. So the second one project that we are currently executing, this, as I mentioned earlier, we have coined this term called cyber signaling. This is primarily intended, meant for, intended for private sidings. And uh, it relates to continuous auto monitoring of railway sidings and also wireless control of train movement. So uh, once again, the fiber bracketing sensing is used to detect the presence or absence of a train from a particular zone. Then we have secured wireless communication protocol has been implemented. Entire yard is made a hotspot with wi for Wi-Fi. Data is stored in the cloud and for analysis. And we are uh, using an app-based user interface for operation of point machine for setting the routes. This is the uh, photograph of the yard where we are working. This is their typical, uh, uh, I would say, the wagon which they carry. Uh, in, in, in JSW, this, this vehicle called Torpedo carries molten metal from one shop to another shop. And this is the, they, need, they need to monitor the movement of such vehicles. So this is, the, this is again a screenshot of uh, the page that will be made available to the driver of the locomotive, which is taking those torpedoes. And uh, that person will have a complete picture of the entire yard, which section is free, which is occupied. If it is occupied, it, the track becomes red. Otherwise it is green. And these are the point machines to set the route. The driver, when it is, he is coming this way, he can choose to go here or he can take a diversion. So at this point, he can touch on this. So the screen uh, shot will change, screen picture will change. He will come to a screen uh, which he can control this point and then he can find out whether the point is in normal or it is in the reverse direction. He can press on the direction intended for the point machine will operate, route will get set and this image on his handheld device will change and he will be authorized to move further. So the driver alone sitting on inside his locomotive would be able to set the route and take the wherever he wants to go. So this is uh, uh, under implementation. We are presently, our team is at Bellari uh, doing this work. These, these are the projects which are already being uh, implemented for clients they have paid for. There are a few more things which we are, we are very quite gung-ho about, which we have demonstrated to the Indian Railways. Uh, I will mention, talk about two. One is for monitoring the 
braking system, whether the brakes are applied or not, or have they been released, and the online monitoring, continuous monitoring of the temperature of the axle box, which is a real pain point for uh, railways world over. So we experimented twice. In fact, we, we had one run in the Bangalore to Chennai Shatabdi. Uh, this, is, this is an important train of Indian railways, which runs between two big cities, Bangalore and uh, Chennai. So we first did it on uh, 1st May, and then on the request of railways, we repeated it on 8th. Uh, this is where we had set up because this is a proof of uh, concept. This is not a product that we have got. So we, we you can see the wires hanging around like that. And uh, she is an assistant professor of IIC at that time. Now she has moved out. So we, we were able to monitor both the brake, whether it is applied or not, and the temperature continuously in real time. So this I would show you. This is here the brake has been applied in the running train. And now the driver has released the brake. So it is going up. So this is how for the entire journey between Chennai, Bangalore and Chennai, we recorded in that. And the railways were very excited about this work. Similarly, we also monitored the temperature of that. You see two, one orange and one blue. This is on the two axle boxes of the same axle. Uh, we, had, we had instrumented two sensors on two sides, and we monitored. What you see is the temperature rise. So starting from Bangalore at six in the morning, it shows zero. That means it is at the ambient temperature. As the train started moving very quickly, the temperature was rising. And at some places, you can see the temperature rise more than 90 degrees centigrade. And uh, I was in that uh, train myself, and we were recording the speed through an app. Uh, at this time, the train speed was about 130, 120, 30 kilometer per hour, and it, it hit 90 degrees, which railway were saying that they were not aware that the temperature goes so high, because as soon as it stops, the temperature drops very quickly. And they monitor at uh, some known places every uh, maybe 100, 200 kilometers, but by then the train has speed is already low and the temperature has gone down. So we were monitoring temperature every second, and that's the plot that I am showing you. So these are the uh, two technologies for which we have al already we have uh, got, obtained the patents, and uh, this is what uh, we we hope will become one of the uh, big things. And here I would like to add that the uh, to the idea to use the fiber brag grating sensing technology for such applications came from IIAC laboratory. They have been working for the last. 15, 20 years on that. And uh, we came, we learned from them. And then with their support, we did some initial studies. And finally, after four years, we have come to this stage where we are offering this uh, to the railways. So this is, uh, we have also been awarded by government of Karnataka for some of the work that we have done in 2018. We were also declared the uh, winners of rail business startup of 2020. So these are some of the patents which have been granted to us. One, one is for axle box temperature measurement. Another one is for axle counting using fiber crack rating. Then there are many more. Uh, on an average, we file about four or five patents every year. So this is it, sir. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you very, very much for giving me this opportunity to make this presentation. Thanks a lot, Anjana ji. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Sinha. Very happy to know about your extensive work uh, done and your effort, uh, your concept research and innovation has seen, uh, it's been implemented at railways and other commercial ventures. Very happy, sir. Thank you for uh, thank joining you. today. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, the next presentation will be from Professor Kotaro Kataoka. He is the Associate Professor at Department of Computer Science and Engineering, IIT Hyderabad, as well as a Senior Researcher at KO Research Institute at F uh, SFC. He has been a member of Asian Internet Interconnection Initiatives 
projects and widely integrated distributed environment project for research on satellite internet post disaster networking and etc he has served as an expert in jica friendship project for facilitating indo japan collaborations between 2012 and 2019 his research interests include internet architecture software defined network network function virtualization blockchain network applications today his topic would be blockchain for trustworthy internet of things over to you kataoka sensei hi everyone this is kotaro kataoka from iit hyderabad Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to deliver a talk in uh, Japan Hub. Uh, this time, I'd like to talk about our uh, making our blockchain for trustworthy Internet of Things. An um, interplay between blockchain and uh, Internet of Things are a very interesting domain to explore. And blockchain um, is our distributed ledger. with our tamper resistance and the um, internet of things is the concept to make everything to be connected smart and uh, automated however um if we try to dump all the iot data to our blockchain and does it really works so um because for example um the iot application is very useful but um you may want to check that that data is really okay and um, however um if you try to rely on the blockchain or uh, to ensure all the data to be kept in the ledger and then also um you know verifiable to be uh, to make the data trustable and um does it really work now um amount of iot data generated by the internet of things devices are actually on zettabyte scale and um uh this is a very big number because for example your laptop computer may have only up to like a tb plus our storage size and your ram we have maybe a gb class um um memory ram space but however you know uh, if you have a look of uh, you know the scale of the iot data that is our uh, uh, glory generated or uh, it is um zeta byte scale now um as a important feature of uh, blockchain each participating node are supposed to maintain the complete copy replica of the ledger for each now if the very good amount of data is also given to the blockchain and then that replica must be maintained by all the participating nodes in a blockchain does it really scale and this is pretty much our questionable and um another thing is for example like a bitcoin is a very robust blockchain and uh, it uses a lot of like our energy to ensure that the double spending cannot happen and um, the data itself is pretty much trustable so our uh, it's like a vault and um this vault is pretty much worst use to store bitcoin considering that the the price of the one bitcoin is now almost like a 37.9 lakh indian rupee so um but however if you think about in uh, iot data so especially the iot data which directly comes from the um iot devices they are like a road data they are the data that 
doesn't generate the value yet as it is. So only after they are processed and then some meaningful um, context and information is extracted from the data and then that data will start to have a value. So now um, the raw data is actually pretty much immature. Now, do you want to put that uh, huge amount of data which may or may not have a value yet into the vault like the blockchain? So um, I would say like uh, IoT data, especially raw data is like um, small change, maybe like a one rupee change, two rupee change, something like that. And then I think you're not attempting to keep these small changes in a vault, even though it is super secure. So if we want to store an um, IoT data, and then can we have any other option that works much better for us, and then it's much cost effective? Now, what we gonna try um, in this talk is that um, we try to explore and implement the lightweight um, blockchain so that the IoT data can still go to the cloud storage. So let's not put the data to the blockchain, okay? But instead, uh, the cloud storage are still good. And then, so let's continue to use it. So, uh, and then uh, we don't bother the blockchain to maintain the raw IoT data as part of the uh, distributed ledger. Instead, um, how does blockchain may help? So um, instead of sending IoT data to the blockchain, we can still send the, some hints to verify that this IoT data is authentic to the blockchain. So in that case, compared with a raw IoT data, this hash value can be much smaller, and then it's realistic to keep in a ledger. Now, only when the IoT data is downloaded from the cloud storage and then used for some application data, and then we're gonna claim that verified data before use. And then how to verify the data is to double check the hash of value that is already stored in a blockchain, and then also the hash value that is regenerated from the um, IoT data. And then if they are matching, it's good. Otherwise, something may be wrong. So um, we designed um, the system that implements the concept of an IoT blockchain. So uh, we call it as a lightweight and scalable DAG-based distributed ledger for verifying IoT data integrity. Or uh, to make it short, it's a um, um, LSDI. And um, these are uh, characteristics of this R uh, LSDI is uh, pretty much uh, lightweight, so that the IoT gateway, which is one component of an um, IoT to collect the data and then send it to the cloud storage. So that IoT data, so you can imagine that uh, it can be a uh, you know, very small computer, something like um, Raspberry Pi. And then this resource constrained device can still operate the IoT blockchain. So, um, how it can um, happen. Now, um, first, as a structure of um, the blockchain, um, we are going for the DAG based R distributed ledger instead of uh, linear blockchain. So, our linear blockchain is like our Bitcoin and Ethereum. That means our blocks are forming um, like a linked list so that um, they can go backward. However, uh, in the case of uh, DAG-based DLT, 
Um, one benefit is that the transactions can be generated and broadcasted at the same time. And then uh, the, the generation of the transaction can be parallelized and uh, within a very short time, uh, the transaction can be confirmed to be a part of uh, um, immutable history in a blockchain. So um, we extend um, that feature so that uh, it will fit for the IoT use cases. Now, um, the design of um, um, this LSDI uh, is uh, basically we have uh, four different types of uh, stakeholders. The number one is the uh, gateway node, and then the storage node, and IoT consumer application, and then finally, the cloud storage. Now, the gateway node, basically it's like a IoT gateway. So it creates the data from the group of our end devices that can be our sensors or actuators or any our smart devices. And then, um, the gateway node uh, generate and broadcast their integrity proofs of the IoT data as a transaction to an LSDI. Now, this integrity proof is generated from the data that is actually the gateway node is responsible to forward it to the cloud storage. However, before sending the raw data to the cloud storage, this gateway node generate a hash value and then broadcast. And then um, this gateway node waits for the confirmation of the transaction ID that is a return value where uh, uh, telling that the hash value is uh, become the part of the immutable history. Now, together with this um, hash data and, uh, and then um, together with the transaction ID, which contains the hash data, and then uh, the IoT data itself will be sent to the cloud storage. And then the storage node is responsible uh, to keep all the um, data in a distributed ledger. So um, this, this uh, storage node should be somewhat powerful for server or some device than the um, gateway node so that they will be, uh, they can afford the much better, uh, higher capacity uh, data storage for maintaining the entire replica of the ledger. So that component is uh, common with the Bitcoin and uh, other uh, blockchain technologies. Now, when the IoT consumer applications wants to use that data. And then, um, so this application can talk to the storage node uh, to get the hash value of the corresponding data. At the same time, um, the IOT, uh, consumer application will download the data from the crowd storage, and then uh, which contains a transaction ID. So um, how this um, IoT application can um, point, pinpoint uh, which hash value to get from the storage node is uh, actually uh, used, uh, pointed by this uh, transaction ID, which was uploaded to the cloud storage by the gateway node. Now, if the um, hash value came from the blockchain, matches the hash value which was regenerated by the downloaded IoT data. That means that data is okay to be used. But otherwise, there can be something wrong in the data. So this is how the IoT application can maintain the trustworthiness of the IoT data to be used. Now, um, there are some techniques to make this IoT blockchain itself 
to be our scalable and also like um, the affordable for the resource constraint our devices. And um, um, the first technique is our the pruning because um, as you can easily imagine, uh, even though uh, IoT blockchain is receiving a much smaller data than the raw IoT data, but still the size of the ledger grows. Now, um, because the, we are expecting that the gateway node can be very small and a resource constraint, we explored how we reduce the our memory consumption on the um, gateway node. And the technique used is a pruning. So instead of uh, maintaining the entire replica of the ledger, so we can focus on maintaining only the, le the recent R data. That still makes sense to be a part of the bigger distributed ledger, but it doesn't pressure much on the resource consumption on the gateway node. And then how we decide uh, to what extent the gateway node should maintain the data is basically the weight that is given to the transaction in the distributed ledger. Now, um, the clustering is another technique so that the gateway can form a group and then reduce the uh, resource consumption like a network bandwidth to broadcast a transaction and also um, the number of the transaction that each gateway must uh, process within a group. And um, that means, um, you know, um, instead of broadcasting one transaction to all the uh, gateway node and uh, uh, storage node in a blockchain network, actually that range of the broadcasting will be limited. Uh, by doing this, so um, the each cluster can focus on transaction, uh, uh, focus on processing the transaction in a group, and then um, that process will be uh, much faster and then lightweight. So this is virtually the meaning of uh, some affordable, um, like a security and a uh, and also like a mode of storing a data. It's not like a vault, but it's more like a coin case. But still, it is high um, scalable. Now, um, we developed this system um, as a proof of concept implementation, and uh, we tested it on uh, our Docker environment. And um, basically, the transaction throughput is very high. It's much higher compared with uh, Bitcoin, like a vault, like a blockchain. It's a lightweight and then high through, uh, transaction throughput. And also, um, because of uh, uh, because um, um, it is like always like a distributed, so the transaction throughput over time does not degrade. So it is always maintaining some level nicely. And then also. Um, if you think about uh, memory usage on a gateway, uh, we, we, when we enable the pruning on the gateway, and then uh, you can see the convergence of the memory usage on a gateway. And then this is basically because of the pruning to maintain the maximum size of, uh, not the maximum, but the uh, reasonable size of uh, distributed ledger replica maintained by a gateway. And also by clustering, the CPU utilization is very low in a gateway node. And then this is very important feature because if the CPU is very busy for processing the blockchain and then the IoT gateway cannot do the other task. But uh, in our technique, um, the CPU utilization is quite low. So that's why you know, I, IoT gateway is not becoming too busy and then they can still continue to work as IoT gateway together with running the um, LSDI gateway function on the same device. And then also the network bandwidth consumption is also converging according to the 
the size of the cluster. And then this is also the, um, the nice feature of um, uh, this LSDI concept. In terms of the finality, this is also very important because um, we shouldn't wait too long until the, the transaction is confirmed as part of the um, uh, immutable history. So uh, this is uh, very fast, basically. And um, now, um, because we make a coin parse like a blockchain, so we also uh, are interested in security. So it is really secure, secure or not. So uh, uh, in our preliminary evaluation, the data tampering is very difficult still. And also like a DOS attack, for example, what happens if the IoT gateway blasts the DOS attack so that uh, IoT, the other IoT gateways will be very busy with uh, meaningless uh, transaction. But still, uh, now in here, uh, we use uh, uh, POW, the very simple quiz to, uh, not simple, it's a difficult quiz to answer, but it's easy to verify. So this is a proof of work. So um, in LSDI, we use a POW to rate to limit the transaction generation. And then also, without having the proper result of the POW, and then a gateway node cannot attach the transaction to the ledger. So this is how we mitigate the impact of our, our gateway spam attacks. So um, this kind of um, the POC is our working very nicely. And then also like uh, we published our, this paper very recently. And um, um, as a message uh, to uh, the audience and attendees uh, of this Japan Haba as a teacher at the Hyderabad. So um, this project was implemented by the BTEC students more or less. And um, it is always uh, fun for me to work with as a, a, we as a student. And uh, also our, this research work was published, but now turned into the core technology for the collaboration with uh, some companies. And then our, we are now our, uh, working towards the uh, deployment for the real world use cases. So it's a very encouraging part of our working with, um, you know, uh, you guys in India. So um, I wish like we can have more collaboration with Japan, but especially involving you know, our Indian students. Thank you very much. And um, looking forward to see you guys in um, uh, q and session. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kataoka-san. Today, I'm sure the students and the young minds will have a lot of information to carry back. Thank you once again, joining from Japan. The next speaker is Dr. Atsuhiro Nakagawa-san. He is into building alliance and co-creation with industry to overcome super aging society. Atsuhiro Nakagawa-san has done MD and PhD. Uh, he is a special appointed professor of clinical research innovation and education at Tohoku University Hospital. He is the design head, experience design and alliance section, Tohoku University Hospital. He is the visiting professor at Toho University, Tokyo. Nakagawa-san will be presenting how they are trying to make a new paradigm through industry alliances to overcome dramatic changes in super aging society. Welcome to you and over to you, Nakagawa-san. Dozo. Hi, I'm Atsuhiro Nakagawa, Special Appointed Professor and Director, Department of Biodesign, Center for Research, Education, Innovation, Tohoku University Hospital, also Assistant for Hospital Director for Industry Alliance and Technology. 
The key message is we have been building infrastructures and systems to understand our constraints and create concepts that elegantly and fundamentally solve the problems across our stakeholders. Japan has one of the highest average life expectancy of 84 years, which has been contributed by Japanese diet and also one of the most accessible healthcare system in the world. Switzerland follows that and 94% says that at least one person they can depend on in a time of needs. Spain, Singapore, Australia, and France was that. On the other hand, United States average life expectancy dropped compared before and after 2016 and considered to be attributed to opioid epidemic and rising rate of despair. Life expectancy is not always the same as health life expectancy. Japanese women spend almost 11 years, men spend almost 9 years in some form of independency. Also, although one of the most accessible healthcare systems have contributed to Japan's long life expectancy, we are facing tough moment for maintenance of accessibility as Japanese society is changing. For example, we are facing to disparity in accessibility to infrastructures providing necessary medical practice. Left map shows that 60 minutes accessible area for tertiary emergency center is worse in the area far from Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, and Fukuoka. Right maps show that 30 minutes accessible area for tertiary emergency centers in Tohoku region or northeastern part of Honshu Main Island, where we are from, are worse in the area far from central highways and Shinkansen. Distribution of medical doctors in the left, hospital in the middle, and rate of living residency program area for young medical doctor shows that general resources are limited in eastern part of Japan, region far from Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, and Fukuoka, such as Tohoku region, are facing to disparity in resources, enough to provide necessary medical practice. In addition to answering how we can increase healthy life expectancy, we are facing increasing economical burden current healthcare system has been designed in early 1960s. In 1965, 9.1 person, productive age person, supported elderly population. And it has been decreased to 2008 to 2.9 and will be decreasing to 2.0 in 2025. For a long time, one of the highest accessibility to medical services has been supported by extensive effort by medical professionals. Recent changes of medical professionals from liability and mindset changes is resulting in changes in working hours. New laws starting from 2024 will be completely prohibited to work above 2,000 hours per year and supposed to be controlled within 960 hours per year, which is constitute 10% and 40% of present medical uh, uh, doctors' working hours. However, we have no definite answers to how we can overcome unbalance between decreasing resources and increasing demands in available and affordable fashion, and how we can make most of emerging technologies. Moreover, pandemic by COVID-19 made the situation even more complicated. In addition to three problems carried over from before Corona, four problems to be solved with and after Corona. 
because we have to solve the problems and the restriction on face-to-face -face activities due to spread of infection. Under those circumstances, we have been building infrastructures and systems to understand our constraints and create concepts that elegantly and fundamentally solve the problems across our stakeholders. Tohoku University have been delivering global impact innovation driven from academic research since its foundation 110 years ago, such as K-Steel, antenna, mass examination for gastric cancer, laser dials, mass spectrosmetry, recording techniques, flash memories, compacting, and tsunami engineering. KSTU have been used globally, but Professor Honda's research on KSTU have been evolved into HDD media, perpendicular magnetic recording, or metal-based spintronic devices, both of which is making great innovation, especially in the material science research and commercialization, including advancement in IoT devices. Therefore, our university have been listed in the top 10 citation ranking in metallurgical engineering, material science of characterization, applied physics and chemistry fields. And it was natural that our research and development was based on our strengths, which is material science and device technologies in the past. Recently, we have started innovation from opposite side, or needs-driven innovation with broad spectrum of stakeholders. We started comprehensive co-creation with Philips since 2018, focusing on changing people's behaviors through digital technology. We have started this through close observation of health continuum, not only focusing on the patient journey in the hospital beginning from diagnosis end up with treatment in the large hospital, but also extending to their normal life, even clinics and facilities that support them. Our Tohoku area, is, as explained previously, is one of the advanced aging areas in Japan. Some constitute 45% of the population and therefore have broad spectrum programs related to high aging society. We are now developing infrastructures and co-creation in our showcase of constraint probably 5 to 10 years ahead of global standards and trying to find issues we're solving together. In Sendai, we start with close observation using design thinking and make rapid progress to prototyping and rough sketches of business model and then accelerate through co-creation with global resources Philips, including four innovation centers, especially one in Bangalore. We also think about global conversion of our insight from the beginning to maximize the impact of our co-creation from the beginning. Let us explain about how we are building showcase of the constraint in our aging societies. We started clinical observation program for the industry called Academic Science Unit, ASU, in 2014. Under joint research contract, industry directly enter the clinical bedside, explore and define needs for working for business through close observation with the medical professional. Most of the company aim to create concept and prototype in the program. We also use design thinking and lean production methods to design the whole process. Left shows number of companies joining this six months program. It has been decreased with pandemic, but we'll be expecting back to normal in July this year, maybe facilitated by web-based interaction. Medical devices companies in the right graph constitute only one force. And high-spec material, pharmaceutical companies constitute almost half of the companies joining this program. Recently, new members shifting to companies which is working on or interested in IoT and digital health. We have extended our infrastructures to co-create beyond the pace of creating concept and prototype trying to facilitate the process based on close clinical observation and co-creation with medical and healthcare professionals.
Open Bet Lab OBL launched in January 2020 and hosting both domestic and non-domestic, both large and startup companies. Here again, we would like to discuss about needs worth solving as business. We would like to talk about the reason why we have started programs like ASU and OBL. We felt that we need new innovation to improve treatment to patients, also our working efficiency. But industry have minimum chance of understanding the real world and medical and healthcare domain. One day, we must company visit us and told us that they have a developed prototype with high sensitivity and specificity for patients with uh, sepsis walking to the clinics. Sepsis is a life-threatening condition that arises when the body's response to infection causes injury to its own tissues and organs. Their question was, what would be other diseases that have high necessities? But I think almost all the medical professionals says that no single patient is visiting local clinic on foot. Unfortunately, it was too late to understand the real world, no room to be bought, and management decided to stop the project. This is example of bad news. You know that there is no news within one second if you go to the appropriate medical environment. This is a case of good news. Young parents talk about their training with night terrors of their small son. They first thought that this is normal process, but sleep deprivation resulted in daytime sleepness for the patient, uh, parents. They were desperate and finally took the kids to the uh, pediatricians. But pediatrician told them that this is benign condition and they should tolerate and wait. A team in Stanford by design observed this, these situations. Interestingly, uh, doctors and medical professional members showed not so much interest in this situation, whereas the engineer members showed great interest, paying attention to the great gaps between the perception perception of the doctors and the uh, parents. And this is one of the reasons why sometimes it is meaningless to ask doctors whether there is unmet medical needs. They went through a series of observations and interviews to understand the mechanism of night terror. They came up to a hypothesis that nighttime terror occurs in abnormal deep sleep in the REM and non-REM sleep cycle as shown in the graph. Once you visualize the mechanism, you can move on to efficient brainstorming and the team came up to the conclusion that nighttime terror can be, can be solved by properly awakening the kids and leverage the technology suits best. Which was end up in a vibration which is 10 times of the iPhone. Lower left graph shows the occurrence of night terrors in purple, which is dramatically uh, turned into green and decreased after the use of rally in the nighttime. Again, this is an example of good news worth working for new businesses. Let me explain another good example. Kaiser Permanent is American integrated and managed care consortium made up of three distinct but interdependent group of entities. The Kaiser Foundation Health Plan and its regional operating subsidiaries, Kaiser Foundation Hospitals, and the regional Permanente medical groups. Kaiser Permanent is one of the largest non-profit healthcare plans in the United States with over 12 million members. Kaiser Permanente's quality of care has been highly rated and attributed to a long emphasis, strong emphasis on preventive care, its doctors being salaried rather than paid on a fee for service basis.
and attempt to minimize the time patients spend in high-cost hospital by carefully planning their stay. Here is a good example of how they use the data to change their uh, uh, behavior change. Tyra is small kids who has bronchial asthma. Tyra is going to uh, go into the soccer game this morning. And analytics, according to the past medical records and, and climate such as humidity, show that uh, he has high chance of uh, having the uh, bronchial asthma attacks. And uh, the warning was sent to uh, his mother's uh, tablet. And the mother decided to bring the inhaler with them to prevent uh, from Tyra from worsening and uh, getting that, that asthma, bronchial asthma attacks. That will be cost saving uh, because they do not have to go to the emergency centers. All those uh, wonderful solutions is starting from clinical observations using design thinking. Finally, we would like to show 10 berries that we provide in Tohoku University Hospital needs defining, process designing, showing proof of concept together with medical professional, consulting, interview, medical professional within and outside Japan, education. We also provide needs definition and concept building support through clinical emergence, understanding minimum essential medical knowledge, and also team building for the entrepreneurs. We also have digital, digital health lab, which could be used to uh, even prototype the AR and VR content, which can facilitate the whole process. Also, mutual networks or communities, important uh, resources that we can provide. But finally, the biggest pro uh, value we, we can provide is being showcase of our constraint and being alliance hub for industry and stakeholders. Because we cannot make the innovation stand alone. We need to co-create. We have been working on research-oriented innovation for a long time. Along with Kroyedo, one of the largest translational research centers in Japan, we establish infrastructure like ASU, OBL, AI Lab to host industry to understand the pain of the stakeholders. Stakeholders we are reaching and trying to develop fundamental but elegant solution, including IoT. Finally, we would like to mention that we are always waiting uh, for a new collaboration with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nakagawa-san. Thank you for the presentation from Tokyo. We now move on to the next presentation from Rakuten India. Mr. Sujit, Associate Director of Rakuten India, and Mr. Ishwar would explain on Rakuten products and technology. Over to you, Sujit. Hello, good afternoon to everyone. I'm Sujit, representing Rakuten India. As for agenda, I will start with providing a high-level overview about Rakuten, and my colleague Ishwar will deep dive on products and technologies that are helping solve key business problems and empowering our society. Rakuten was founded in 1997, launching online shopping marketplace in Japan. Since then, 
we have expanded globally and spread our wings in various industry sectors like internet services, fintech, and mobile. In Japanese, Rakuten means optimism. Rakuten Group has 70 plus business services covering a broad range of online and offline services, including e-commerce, travel, digital content related services, fintech, credit cards, banking, securities, insurance, and communications, including a mobile carrier service and professional sports. It's an ecosystem of services with membership at the core and almost 1.4 billion members across the world. This is what makes us strong. We also have a very strong member loyalty program called Rakuten Points. Users earn approximately 1% of the purchase price in points, which is one point is equals to one Japanese yen. And these points can be applied on future purchases to save money. This is our way of saying thank you for using our services. This is our global footprint of technology global hub. Uh, we have about 5,000 technology uh, members across the globe and product and technology center in Bangalore has expanded significantly with over 1000 plus employees. These are the products in various Rakuten group companies that we are, have direct impact on from Rakuten India. We are involved in product development in these companies directly. We are contributing to various business services such as commerce, fintech, media and sports, communication and energy, and many more. We're also extremely active in hosting external events. We conduct hackathons every year and also hosted a virtual product conference in late 2020. The event was highly successful in drawing participation and more than 2,300 joined the event from 27 different countries. Now this year, we are going big with hackathon event. This will be our third hackathon event. And this time we are going completely virtual. And it will be a 24 hour event where students, working professionals participate, submit their ideas, build a product prototype within 24 hours and present it to jury members. Top five winners will be, win big prize money with worth 15 lakh rupees. Being a global innovation company, our mission is to contribute to society by creating value through innovation. We believe that Rakathon 2021 is the perfect stage to make the world a better place using technology. Registrations have started and we're accepting entries via Hacker Earth platform. So please mark the dates. We are doing this event on 9th and 10th of April, 2021. So please head to Hacker Earth platform and submit your product idea today. Thank you very much for listening. And I will hand over to my colleague Ishwar, who will deep dive on some of our products. Ishwar, please take it away. Thank you, Sudhir San. Hello, everyone. I'm Ishwar, and I lead business development initiatives for Rocket in India. Today, I would like to talk about the proliferation of digital in companies and how technology is fueling businesses and impacting us all. I'd also like to focus on how Rakuten is helping companies around the globe to succeed with technology. I'd highlight some of the solutions that we have built, leveraging a plethora of cutting edge tech, spanning proprietary and open source frameworks to deliver value and help solve real world challenges. So without further ado, let's jump right in. The pandemic has not just spared, but has accelerated digital growth. Despite the disruptions caused globally, enterprise IT teams are marching towards a digital destiny of sorts, since most of the products and services today are either based on digital delivery models or they require digital capabilities to stay in the competitive plane now. An IDC report states that 65% of the global GDP is going to be digitalized by 2022. And this is driving $6.8 trillion of IT spend. The COVID-19 pandemic has also highlighted that a company's ability to adapt and respond 
to unplanned and unforeseen business disruptions will be a clear determiner of success in this increasingly digitalized economy. And also a large percentage of a company's future revenue depends upon its responsiveness and scalability and resiliency of its IT systems. Racket in India is helping enterprises achieve value-based outcomes with technology in this new digital age. Here are some of the trends that which we see in the market. Organizations are being driven to incorporate intelligence in possibly every product and service they build. And according to IDC, by 2023, a quarter of the global 2000 companies will acquire at least one AI software startup to ensure ownership of differentiated skills and IP. The trend also indicates that organizations that develop in-house AI solutions and data services will move into a subscription model to open doors for new revenue opportunities. Another trend that is prevalent is that by 2021, 80% of enterprises globally will put a mechanism in place to shift to cloud-centric infrastructure and applications. Another trend that we see is that in the next three years, all IT and automation initiatives across the globe will have a cloud ecosystem as the underlying framework that extends resource controls and even real-time analytic capabilities. And in order to get there, organizations are integrating analytics powered by AI, machine learning, and they're adopting automation. And they're also exploring self-driving infrastructures that are enabled by serverless processes. As business dynamics change, we clearly understand that technology and people are the core pillars of innovation in this new age. With this potent combination in Rakuten, we are creating value for enterprises and companies around the globe. Today, I'd like to highlight six key fields where technological innovations are causing disruptions. Medical sciences. Our pioneering work in the field of medical technologies have enabled us to contribute in helping cure cancer using photoimmunotherapy. Our proprietary Illuminox technology platform and our antibody conjugate help induce robust anti-cancer effects in animals. Customer sciences. Our team has developed cool machine learning algorithms and analytic technologies that help businesses to increase customer acquisitions and their lifetime value. Product sciences. The AI powered algorithms we work help e-commerce companies to understand more about the product's portfolio gaps, analyze price competitiveness, and also identify and onboard new merchants. Basically, it helps them enrich their catalog. In the telecom and mobile space, we launched the 5G services in Japan recently. We also introduced the world's first E2E cloud-native software-based telecom network. Our innovations in conversational AI goes beyond the traditional chatbot approaches to deliver true conversational experiences for users. Rakuten leverages open source technologies to deliver value-based outcomes for companies with our Sixth Sense observability platform. Gaining insights from your data requires more than just collecting and analyzing metrics and logs. With the acceleration of customer and business demands, 
site reliability engineers now require operational visibility into their entire IT architecture, something that traditional APM tools or logging tools aren't equipped to provide. Observability enables organizations to inspect and understand the full IT stack. The sheer volume and the variety of the data that is being collected is fundamentally unmanageable by humans and traditional monitoring tools. Observability allows the questions to be asked and the systems to manage themselves using AI and machine learning. The learning algorithms can understand the past health of the services and applications to predict what's going to happen in the future. The Sixth Sense Observability Platform encompasses four main tool sets. Sixth Sense Probe is a comprehensive APM solution that can help understand the performance of any application within an enterprise. Sixth Sense Pulse helps understand and monitor the health of API and endpoints. Sixth Sense Fusion helps run applications at scale without the complexity of maintaining the underlying infrastructure. Buzzer is our incident response tool, which also features multi-channel notifications. Rakuten enables technology not just for enterprises, but for all. The Rakuten Rapid API platform is the world's largest API marketplace. With over 2 million developers worldwide, including startups, building innovative and cool solutions using our collection of public APIs, 20,000 plus public APIs. Rakuten's people, processes, and technology help deliver value for enterprises and companies across the globe with future-ready technology platforms and solutions and help them to innovate and achieve scale and automation in production. We would like to thank you for your time.